fatal shooting on the Lower Clapton Road. It's known as London's Murder Mile. Crack cocaine has arrived and brought with it an explosion of robbery and violence. This is the second murder in the space of a few days in July 1990. The victim is 42-year-old Baldeep Hundel. His son saw him shot in cold blood. The police are under pressure, but five months after the killing and the off-license, one clue, the cap, leads to two arrests. They will result in the conviction of 20-year-old Oliver Campbell for murder. The worst thing he had ever done was vandalize a telephone box, but now he is serving a life sentence. He insists he has nothing to do with the shooting. Oliver Campbell says his conviction has been a terrible mistake. Eric Samuels, the other man arrested at the time, served five years in prison. A career criminal, Samuels admitted he was in the off-license that night and escaped a murder charge by pleading guilty to robbery. He is the person who can tell the world if Oliver Campbell really is innocent. For the past nine months, we've been investigating Oliver Campbell's conviction for murder. Yes, hello, I wonder if you can help me. I'd like to speak to prisoner Oliver Campbell, please. Hold on. Morning. Morning, hello, is that Oliver? Yes. Hi, it's Kirsty Wark here from the Rough Justice Programme. Really During that time, we've uncovered fresh evidence which points to a terrible miscarriage of justice. We've examined the events leading to Campbell's arrest, trawled through the police interviews with him. And looked at the forensic evidence, or lack of it, involved in the case. Carry, yep. Yeah, that's in um, Ab um, Stratford, but I don't know if it's closed down now. Don't worry, don't worry, that's fine. The other thing is we're still hopeful of getting a statement from Eric Samuels. Above all, we've tried to track down Eric Samuels, the man who was with the gunman that night, to see if his version of what happened can help Oliver. But finding Eric Samuels proved extremely difficult. After he was released from prison, he seemed to have disappeared. There was no sign of him on the electoral roll. We contacted Eric's old solicitors. They said the last anyone had seen or heard of him was that he was sleeping rough around Waterloo Station. Yes, I'm looking for a flight called Eric Samuels. Got a street and a tenant. But as the weeks went on, we eventually found that some people did know of Eric Samuels. At least they recognized his street name, Tenants, but he hadn't been seen for some time. I know a bloke called Jesus Tenants, a black guy. Yeah. I don't know if that's how you got his name. Okay. Do you know him at all? You don't know him. But a street name of Tenants. Yeah. Cheers. Okay, bye. With the search stalled, we concentrated on a number of other crucial areas of the case which might help Oliver Campbell prove his innocence. His medical notes reveal that when he was eight months old, a severe brain trauma had left him with serious shortcomings. His IQ was registered as borderline mentally defective. Most of his 20 years had been spent in care, and at the time of his arrest, he had just ended a period with a foster mother. Jean Jackson fostered Oliver when he was 16 and knows him better than anyone. My brief really was to um, support him in um, getting to a stage where he could live on his own, so preparing him for independent living really. Um, and usually it would take two years, but they asked me if I would consider having him for three years because he did, he did have learning difficulties and so needed that extra support. People who know Oliver believe that his mental shortcomings should have been apparent to those who came into contact with him. First thing you can tell with Oliver is that he has learning difficulties and um, he's in some ways backwards for, work, for use of a better word and that he's clumsy as well and that he would be behaving like a child, especially then at the age of 19. And he should definitely have had legal representation straight away. But Oliver was treated as a normal suspect. 
what he said then would come back to haunt him. For the morning following his arrest, he would have no legal representation. He made a number of crucial admissions, which indicated he may have known something about the murder. During the journey to the police station, he's recorded as saying, I remember it all from Crime Watch UK. A month earlier, the program had featured the murder of Mr. Hundel and the baseball cap found near the scene of the crime. The police had traced the cap to this sports store in East London. A saleswoman had identified Oliver as having bought it. The whole case rests on who was wearing the cap at the time of the shooting. Oliver admits it's his, but insists that it was stolen by another man before the murder. But crucially, when he was arrested, he didn't make this clear. He was taken to the nearest police station and asked if he wished to have a solicitor present. Oliver said no. Two officers interviewed him. They asked him about the baseball cap, which he said he'd seen on television. But they asked Oliver where he dropped it, so he said he couldn't remember. Then he said he dropped the hat in the shop where the shooting happened. That was nonsense. The hat was not dropped in the shop. It's inconsistencies like this in the interviews which are highly significant. First of all, it's very unfortunate that the police asked this mentally very backward boy a question which plainly was unfounded. And secondly, it's very striking that he almost immediately agreed that he had dropped the hat in the shop, even though he plainly hadn't. So why would anyone admit to things which simply were not true? In order to understand what was going on, we asked an eminent forensic psychologist to examine the transcripts of the interviews. Professor Brian Thomas Peter identifies several examples where admissions are wrong. He begins with the dropping of the cap. Well, uh, during that interview, uh, again, we have to start from understanding that uh, Oliver Campbell was someone who wants to be normal. He's a limited individual, and he's developed a strategy which has involved uh, facilitating conversation in a very acquiescent way. So he picks up pieces of information, and with those pieces of information, sustains conversation without real meaning. Yeah, and, and, that, and during that interview, of course, he talks about knowing the shop and so forth. Yes, he says he was there, but can't remember who served him. The officer says... What time of day would that be, then? Mostly after, like, working hours or before. B before. What, after work or before? Yeah. The officer offers, you don't remember? No, I don't remember. So it's a very nice illustration of how he's trying to facilitate conversation and participate without any meaning at all inherent in that, and as soon as you pin him down, it becomes obvious. But presumably the key thing about this is not just that it's gobbledygook, but that, you know, unknowingly, Campbell is implicating himself from the start by yes. assuming knowledge of this shop. Yes, and placing himself in that area that he knows that area, even though he doesn't. After his first interview, officers drove Oliver around Hackney, still without any legal representative. The conversation was only sketchily recorded. The officers asked him about a mate he'd mentioned to the police already. We now know this mate was Eric Samuels, who had been on the robbery. Oliver is taken to another police station. By this time, he's been questioned by the police for a total of four hours, and the circumstances of some of these conversations are highly unusual. For many years, our system has insisted that as far as possible, when suspects are interviewed about serious offences, a record should be made at the time. It's usually on tape. Sometimes it's in a contemporaneous written note. Now, in this case, there were at least five occasions when, for a total of about an hour and a half in all, Oliver was being spoken to about the offence by police officers, and no record was being made. Finally, five hours after his arrest, Oliver is examined by a doctor. Only now is he recognized as suffering from a significant mental handicap 
and to be of limited intelligence. The police now arrange for a solicitor. Eight hours after his arrest, Oliver Campbell will be interviewed with full legal protection for the first time. As well as a solicitor, Campbell now had what's called an appropriate adult present. It's a safeguard for people with recognized mental difficulties like Oliver. There is also a new officer in charge of the questioning. He soon picked up on the baseball cap. So, what happened to the hat? I can't remember what happened to it. And I'm saying, why is that? Because I went somewhere else afterwards. Where was that? I don't know where it was. So you don't remember where you went either? No. Got a very convenient memory, haven't you? If you check up on my medical... Yes, what? What if I check up on your medical? You find out a lot about me. I won't find out what happened to your hat, will I? What, yeah, so, so when you see that, you'll find out a lot about me. What, what, what does that tell us about the relationship at that point? She's frightened by this, and he said, would you look at my past medical records? Don't you know that I can't cope with this? But, you know, to anyone outside in the public, uh, they wouldn't find that necessarily problematic about police questioning. I think a lot of people imagine police questioning is very direct and often aggressive. Oh, indeed, and there's nothing wrong with asking questions like this. The difficulty is that with someone like Campbell, it has a different character. It will have a different influence on him than it might for someone who is a hardened criminal. As the interview went on, the police repeatedly referred to the forensic evidence at the scene of the crime, which they suggested could link Oliver to the murder. Are we going to find your fingerprints on that can of tenants? No comment. Because there were fingerprints in that shop. And there's something else about you. Your fingerprints would be on our records, would they? No comment. You won't take us long to find out if they're your fingerprints. And there were hairs in that hat as well. That's why we're going to take samples of yours. Because it's the same, isn't it? It's your hat. I know it's my hat. The importance of this is that they're overwhelming him with external, unverifiable evidence. That's unverifiable from uh, Campbell's point of view, which must have been overwhelming. So he's building up this picture for Campbell of his guilt. In, well, it's not that uh, Campbell actually has a sense of being guilty, but it does seem that he would have a sense that uh, he's going to be convicted because there are witnesses, there's, there's fingerprints, there's hair samples, there are a range of things that place him there. The police have taken hair samples and fingerprints, but at this stage, tests haven't been done. And much later, when the results come in, contrary to what they've inferred over and over again to Oliver, there is no forensic evidence linking him to the scene of the crime at all. We already know that despite what Oliver said, the cap was not dropped in the shop. There are hairs in the baseball cap, but they do not match Oliver Campbell's. And the fingerprints, none of the fingerprints taken at the scene of the crime matches his. The good news for the police was that they did have eyewitnesses. A woman passerby claimed to have seen a man outside the shop wearing a distinctive baseball cap. And Mr. Hundel's son had a clear view of his father's murderer. Yet, at an identity parade at Brixton Police Station, Philip Hundel did not pick out Oliver Campbell as the man in the baseball cap who'd shot his father. The woman passerby also failed to identify him as the man outside the shop. This is hardly surprising. All eyewitness testimony at the time clearly identified both men as being under six feet either 5 foot 10 or 5 foot 11. Oliver Campbell is a towering 6 feet 3. In fact, his size is immediately apparent to anyone who meets him. I was surprised at his height. <laughs> um, he was sort of towering over everybody. Uh, we call him the gentle giant. First thing you notice about Oliver is his height. And the, the, the general size of him, he's got very large hands, he's very very heavily built. Oliver is a very big guy, he's six foot three, six foot four. One eyewitness did eventually give evidence against Campbell. 
Mark Purchase, an Australian photographer, reported the incident on his mobile. Later that night, he helped the police search for evidence. And somewhat unusually, it was he who found the baseball cap. But at the identity parade, he's of no use. He does not pick out Oliver. Like everyone else, he described the robbers as under six foot. But six weeks later, he's changed his mind. The gunman was number nine, Oliver Campbell. But in court, the judge warned the jury to be wary of Mark Purchase. He told them that if the trial rested on his evidence alone, there would be no case against Oliver. We wanted to ask Mark Purchase why he'd changed his mind about that night. We eventually tracked him back to his native Australia. Can you remember which one had the gun at all? I'm sure it was the tall one had the gun. But, um, the tall one had the gun because I saw something there, but I can't, I could never tell you the colour of the gun, but I definitely saw something there, do you know what I mean, in the right hand. Right, one was definitely taller than the other because in the initial statement that you gave, you said they were both about five foot ten, they're both about the same. One was, one was, one was, um, um, one was about a head taller than the other one. Right. I only ask about it because in your, one of your initial statements, you said they were both about five foot ten, you see. Uh, That's... One. one was definitely... I think the one, the one that was slightly taller, I think it was a bomber jacket he had on, actually. We spoke to Mark Purchase for an hour, but he couldn't give us a consistent story. The same problem the judge had identified in court. As the police continued interviewing Oliver, they were still ignorant of the outcome of the eyewitness or forensic evidence. But they kept trying to persuade him to confess. It would appear that you were the gunman. You were the man that put that gun to Mr. Hundle's head and shot him dead for no reason that anybody really understands. Now think about what's putting you in that position. You can't account for your hat. You can't account about what you said to Carla. There are fingerprints on the can in the shop. There are hairs in the hat that was found nearby. People did see you there. What happened? You were sitting there, living a nightmare. I can see it. I can feel it. Now, what happened that night? What would the impact of that have been at this stage on Oliver? Well, it, it must have been overwhelming to have um, that amount of evidence and implication put to you in quite that way, and also um, implying that um, there might be a way out if it was an accident or something of that kind. It, might, it must have caused a great deal of confusion, it, certainly in that situation for a normal person. I think they would find that very stressful. The emotional consequences are, must have been very fearful. The officers continued to insinuate that there may be forensic evidence to link him to the crime, but Oliver repeatedly denied involvement. And on the second day of the interview, now with a senior partner from the firm representing him, Oliver seemed to grow in confidence. In turn, his solicitor began to challenge some of the officers' tactics. Can we move on then, officer? Playing staring games. Nothing to say. Can we move on to the next question, like my solicitor said? I'll dictate the pace of the interview. Well, that's fine, so long as you're fair. I am fair. Now then, yesterday you all but admitted shooting a man. It's interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, he's rested. He hasn't been interviewed previously that day. Um, he hasn't been put under stress. Again, is implacably opposed to anything that's being put to him by the officers. His solicitor is not passive in any of that process, but in fact, on one occasion of that interview, his solicitor interjects, can we move on then, officer, playing staring games? There's obviously something going on which the legal representative feels is unnecessary. Then the officer comes in, I'll dictate the pace of the interview. The solicitor, well, that's fine as long as you're fair. Officer, I am fair. Now then, yesterday, you all but admitted shooting a man. At that point, Campbell has nothing to say. And he doesn't really budge from that position during the interview. No comment, 
no comment, no comment, no comment. At this stage in the investigation, the police are concentrating on the premise that the hat ties Oliver Campbell to the scene of the crime. But we wanted to establish whether Oliver was actually capable of shooting the man in the off-license. We asked Frank Swan, a ballistics expert with 40 years' experience, to examine the crime. If we, uh, if we get, can get the actors, get the actors in. if I can just have a look where you're going to do what. As part of his investigation, he studied all the available evidence from the scene of the crime, right, autopsy and ballistics reports. Okay. You can see there's blood on the floor here. There appears to be blood there. There is blood here. He then used a group of actors to recreate the crime scene in the shop, which he videotapes for later analysis. And the next thing you know, this situation develops a short struggle, no punching or kicking. He produces a weapon. So he doesn't produce it outside, he produces it inside. And after a short struggle, there's a bang and you fall to the floor. And he asked the actors to recreate the actual moment the gun was fired. Nice and gently, just put you into a struggle position, pull the gun out. Now, try and sh you've got to shoot him at right angles to his ear. You still want me to look around? You can do what comes natural to you, right? This is Frank Swan's conclusion about the shot which killed Mr. Hundel. The angle of entry uh, would suggest that it would need to be done by somebody who was right-handed. Well, the trajectory right? The trajectory is right for a right-handed shot. Yeah. So as far as you're concerned, Baldi yeah. Hundel was shot by a right-handed right person. Was in the air. Right. It's 99 percent sure that it was a right-handed person. Yes. Frank Swan's certainty that the gunman used his right hand to shoot Mr. Hundel is incredibly important. No one had ever picked up on the significance of which hand Oliver used and how it would affect the case, so we did. We secretly filmed Oliver. He had no idea we were doing this, carrying out everyday tasks. And then we analysed the evidence. So you've had a chance to look at this tape now. So, you know, we're trying to work out whether he's left hand or right hand. What are all the pointers? Well, on balance, it's, it's um, evidence that he's not very good with either hand, but he has a preference for his left. I mean, in this illustration here, uh, this clip, he's holding the mobile phone with his right hand and using his better hand to press the buttons on it. He also puts the phone to his left ear with his left hand. He wears his watch on his right hand, perhaps because he can do it up better with his left, that kind of thing. So on balance, it's pretty good evidence that he has a preference for his left hand. This is hardly surprising. His medical notes tell us that the same severe blow to his head as a baby which affected him mentally also resulted in the severely restricted use of his right hand. To be certain, Frank Swan wanted to carry out his own tests and he filmed the results. There were a number of things which would show Frank which side Oliver favoured. He measured his biceps to see which side was more developed. Then he threw balls of paper to see which hand Oliver found it easier to catch with. And he tried signing his name with both hands. These and other tests were conducted over a period of 40 minutes. Then, Frank Swan was certain. Watching him do various things, um, I came to the conclusion that he was left-handed. So independent analysis of the crime and Oliver's disability make it highly unlikely that he is the murderer. The gunman is right-handed. Oliver's brain trauma makes him left-handed. Right angles. Just to be sure, we asked Frank Swan to explore this possibility. Could a left-handed gunman have fired the shot that killed Mr. Hundo? Pull him into you, if you like, a bit closer. Get closer. You're struggling, and I want you to put that gun and keep your finger on the trigger. That's just not why. I tried every possible reconstruction that I know to put him in a position, the deceased, where he could sh be shot by someone left-handed. And I found that it was virtually impossible to do and impractical from a robbery point of view. We also asked Frank Swan to look at Oliver's story about how he's supposed to have carried the gun. He tells the police this. 
Yeah, it was underneath my left arm. Okay. How did you keep it there underneath your left arm? I tied it with a piece of string. I see. So where was the string tied? No. I meant the string was tied like there was two pieces. One it was like tied around it, so I had to untie it before I could took it out. I've never come across anybody making a string holster for the purposes of a robbery. Normally, if they've got a long pocket, they put the gun in the pocket, or they put it into their belt, or they put it into one of their outside pockets, so that rather a bit like the, the old gangster films where they can bring it up into a fire position. It doesn't make sense to make uh, a string holster whatsoever. Professor Brian Thomas Peter also finds this story deeply significant. It gives him proof that Oliver's mental disabilities will lead him to admit to something which he is almost certainly physically incapable of doing. And yet, uh, in his so-called confession, he has tied with his right hand, with two pieces of string, a gun in such a way that he has to actually untie the string to get the gun off, then fire it with his right hand under pressure in a situation where supposedly he's about to commit a murder. I mean, what's the likelihood of that? It just seems a very unlikely scenario, and it particularly in the situation of having panicked, and as you say, the stress. But the real psychological issue here is that would someone with this kind of disability prepare to use his weakest hand in the using of a gun? And the answer to that must be no. His denial of the shooting continues throughout what was to be the final interview on Saturday afternoon. No comment, no comment, no comment, no comment. Then at around seven o'clock, Oliver's solicitor leaves the police station. He left his telephone number and strict instructions that he was to be contacted if any further interviews were to take place that night. Around half an hour later, the station custody records note the arrival of Oliver Campbell's foster mother. The police have told her Oliver is in serious trouble and she has agreed to see if she can help. It was very incoherent, the whole thing. Um, he wasn't talking very straight, really. He um, was talking about a hat, um, he, and that he had bought this hat, um, and that um, he had gone to Leicester Square, and that he had given or sold the hat to some bloke that he'd met down there, and that this hat was uh, found near the robbery scene. It was very kind of confused story. It didn't mention anything to do with the robbery or anything like that. A statement from the lead detective records. I entered the interview room and I explained the requirement for an appropriate adult. Mrs. Jackson agreed to accept the responsibility. Mrs. Jackson asked if I thought he was guilty. I said I really believe he shot the man. I don't think it was murder. As the appropriate adult, I explained Oliver's rights to her and they both declined a solicitor. They said something about Oliver was ready to confess um, uh, uh, more about the, the robbery um, and to say who was involved. And of course, I was, you know, happy to, to do that because I wanted him to, to say because I didn't believe that he had done, done what they said he had. The police statement further records that on his way back to the cells, Oliver tells the officer... Something inside of me has wanted to tell the truth. It's like a door opening inside of me. I don't want to lie. I shot the Asian man. I told him not to speak and left him in the cell. Just 25 minutes later, Oliver has completely changed his story. Like, I pulled the trigger by accident. Sorry, could you say that again? I said I pulled, I was like the one that like pulled the gun on him and like shot him. It sounded completely different from when he was on his own with me. When, when, when I was on, when he was on his own with me, it was the usual Oliver, um, 
backwards and forwards, repetition, um, telling the story, but um, you know, not not telling the story in a kind of fluent way. Um, then in the second interview where the officers were present, it was a completely different story, like a news story, that he'd got this gun from, um, or had bought this gun from somebody, and that he and this other person went to this park and was practicing shooting. Where did you practice with it? In the fields, whereabouts? Anywhere, anywhere where there's no one to hear me shooting. Does this sound like a true story? Does it sound like a fairy tale? It sounds like a poorly constructed fabrication. Um, and we can point to any number of internal inconsistencies. How many bullets did you have? About two or three. What? No. How many bullets were you given? About a dozen. Does this ring true to you? Well, none of it rings true because it's inconsistent. It's internally inconsistent. For example, he can't describe the gun very well. Um, he, um, and yet he also says that he had um, an opportunity to practice. Um, he didn't know whether he kept the gun in a field or in a forest. Um, the forest he used to go to, but he doesn't know what it was called or where it was. There, there, there's just so many inconsistencies here. Nevertheless, following the interview, Oliver is charged with murder. He has since retracted his confession and to this day protests his innocence. But why would he confess to something he did not do? But the fact is, he said he did it. Indeed. Something happened which encouraged him to believe that that was in his best interest thereby sealing his feet. Why do you think that happened? Why did he do it? Well, I think, uh, I think anyone would have to believe that they were going to be convicted anyway. In order to do this, you'd have to think, well, they've got enough evidence to convict me, so that's going to happen. He may have felt that he was going to get convicted no matter what, and secondly, that it might not be so bad to confess, providing he could tell people it was an accident. Oliver Campbell's confession that he killed Mr. Hundel happened once again when he had no qualified legal representation in the room. It is undoubtedly very unusual where there's been a sequence of interviews in the presence of a solicitor, which have been interviews of denial, and then the one interview where he admits it is made in the absence of a solicitor although it's fair to say, of course, that his foster mother was there. But Oliver's foster mother has now told us that she believes she failed in her duty as an appropriate adult and wasn't aware of the full story. I was terribly frightened, absolutely shocked and upset because I realised the predicament um, that um, I'd put Oliver in that I was in. It's at 8.40 that night that Oliver finally confesses. But it's the two and a half hours leading up to that moment and the circumstances surrounding the confession that we find so deeply troubling. We've obtained the notes made by the solicitor about that night. They confirm his insistence on being contacted if the police wish to interview Oliver again. But they also reveal he was so angry that he made a formal complaint against the officer who extracted the confession. The complaint got nowhere and the police were exonerated in court. But Jean Jackson was so upset, she asked for the interview to be stopped. She felt physically sick. Do you think there's any chance that Oliver Campbell could be guilty of that crime? I don't think he could have fired that gun at all. If Oliver Campbell didn't fire the gun, then who did? His garbled and inconsistent version about that night was the only one heard in court. But we have discovered that there's another much clearer account of who was really in the shop that night, which the jury never heard.
Eric Samuels had given an account of what really happened, we had to find him. Right, I'm looking for a guy called Eric Samuels, uh, this black guy. Um, he might have a gold tooth, but he's got a street name of Tennant. But the week spent making inquiries got us nowhere. And then we found a clue. I've asked three people, and they know him, but he's gone. I mean, he's not been there for at least 12 months. But I've been told for you to check at least the Hackney front line. And it was here in East London, a few hundred yards from the scene of the shooting, that we discovered Eric Samuels was alive, off the streets, and receiving professional help. The reason we've been looking so hard for Eric Samuels is this piece of paper. It's a version of events Samuels gave the police before the trial. It completely exonerates Oliver Campbell. During the past five months, we've been in contact with Samuels, and we know he's given a fresh statement to his solicitor which says exactly the same as this one does. Campbell wasn't there. But he won't release this statement or give us an interview because he's so terrified about the reaction of the real murderer. Because this new statement is locked away, we decided it was in the public interest to record secretly what Eric Samuels had to say, but to protect his identity. Do you remember it well? Yeah, good one. Really? I mean, I know that you want to help. Tell the truth, that's all. About Oliver wasn't there and things like that. Hmm. Tell them the whole story, how the incident happened. And how Oliver was connected to the incident. Sworn statement that he's not there. He wasn't there at the time. What, what do you mean? Because that's the kind of thing that why, will make them why, nervous. Why, why Oliver was got arrested in the first place. Why he got arrested, put it down to the hat, hats on the cap. And how Oliver got his cap taken away from him. Mm -hmm. Things like that. This is Eric Samuels' account of the killing, which has never been heard in court. On the night of the robbery, he was in Leicester Square. With him, another man, someone who he describes as... A bad and crazy man. We went up west. This man taxed all his hat, and he couldn't do nothing about it, so he just went off. That's how all his hat got used. Once Oliver has left the two men on their own, they leave Leicester Square together. This man wanted to do a rob. We started driving around looking for some way to rob. I said it was stupid to do it round here. During the course of the journey, the man reveals to Eric just how far he's prepared to go, but Eric sticks with him. The man asked if I knew anywhere around my way to rob, so he went back to Acne. I went into lots of off licenses. I started in Cambridge Eve and went into one that we did. We went in and did it, and he fucking shot him. It's at Wandsworth Prison that Eric Samuels first indicated that he'd something to tell the police three days after his arrest. In his initial recorded interviews, he'd offered no comment to every question, but then he wrote a letter to the police. To Detective Wilkins. Could you arrange another interview as soon as possible? It's urgent, as you know. I would like a solicitor there as well. But when the police come to interview him again, he won't say anything more. He's been advised that it would be better to say nothing. It's not doing my case any good, you know. Saying that I know about the gun and all that. And if that was played to the jury, you know. I'll get convicted and all. I told him the truth in the beginning, but after a while, I shut up. If I didn't shut up, I'll get convicted and all. I'll murder. But why was the story that another man, not Oliver Campbell, had been with Eric Samuels that night never heard in court? What I think happened was this. I think the prosecution decided that that evidence was inadmissible because those admissions by Samuels were not made under caution. And so the jury didn't hear them during the prosecution case. Now, if Samuels had given evidence, then Campbell's counsel could have cross-examined him. But Samuels didn't give evidence. And so because of the way the law was in those days, those admissions that someone else had been responsible were never heard by the jury. That's outrageous, though. Well, I think it will 
offend many people's sense of justice. The details Eric Samuels gave about the real gunman, his name, the part of London he's from, and aspects of his criminal career, all point to one man, a man we can only refer to as H. We know that a man who matches all the information we have about the mystery gunman was interviewed by the police at Wandsworth Prison five weeks after Oliver Campbell had confessed. At this point, a whole series of questions are put to the man called H. He flatly denies any involvement in the crime, that he knows anyone called Eric or Oliver, or indeed, that he ever wears hats. But when he's asked if he's prepared to give any hair samples, he replies, I'd rather see my solicitor first. We know that the police took hair samples from prime suspects in the case. Eric Samuels, Oliver Campbell, and two other men were also tested. But we could find no record of any hair samples being taken from the man H, the man who most closely matches the description given by Eric Samuels. But there's another mystery surrounding the forensic evidence. We know that Oliver Campbell was fingerprinted, and his prints didn't match any found in the shop. How significant was this? What do you make of the way that certain supposed facts were given to Oliver? For example, that it was likely that it was his fingerprint on a can of tenants. Well, I find that interesting from this point of view, because the assumption behind that question is that it's the gunman who has handled that can. If the print is not Oliver's, and it's the print of the gunman, then whose print is it? We wanted to find out more about the forensic evidence left behind in the shop, and in particular, the fingerprints found at the scene of the crime. Could they help us to identify who'd been there on the night? But the original case files we have offer no further clues. We managed to track down previously undisclosed files of forensic evidence, but they were of no use either. There is confirmation in the files that the hairs in the cap did not belong to Oliver, but little else. In fact, the very evidence which the police indicated could put Oliver at the scene of the crime. You want to take us long to find out if they're your fingerprints? And there were hairs in that hat as well. Would appear to lose its significance in the case following Oliver's confession. So huge questions remain unanswered. Did the police fail to arrest the murderer despite the fact they'd been given a real lead? And once the cap seemed to fit Oliver, did they pursue all available avenues? These questions can only be resolved if and when the full forensic evidence comes to light. Oliver Campbell has been in prison for more than 10 years now. His supporters have never wavered. They've steadfastly maintained his innocence. I've seen him in prisons up and down the country and asked him out right once, are you guilty in any way of this crime or do you know anything about it? And he said, honestly, Ashton, no. And their firm belief is now backed up by the work of some of the country's leading experts. This young man isn't a callous murderer. He would not take pleasure in murdering. So he didn't fire that shot, did he? It seems very, very unlikely. It's, uh, it's incredible. I have very carefully considered all the paperwork, the photographs, and all the evidence. I have grave doubts as to whether um, the person concerned who has been convicted of the crime uh, did, in fact, commit the crime. And now, finally, we have the true version about what happened that night 11 years ago. What was in there? You think about that? It's all the same, man. It's not there. It wasn't there. Rough Justice believes that Oliver Campbell must be freed.